Okay, uh, let's get started. How are you guys? I was away for a week. Is it a good week? Um, so, we have already learned um, in the first two weeks the core concepts that you could work as a scientific research assistant somewhere and help someone out. And the third week, we learned uh, some concepts, the object-oriented programming stuff. A lot of scientists don't even use that. It's a little more advanced, but if you work for um, Google or any corporation, any company, um, the code that they write is going to be very object-oriented. And you might have already saw in the first two weeks, though we didn't know it, we were already working with objects. Um, we just didn't know what they were. And so I think that it's important to give a little context about what object-oriented programming is. You don't have to be an expert at it, but knowing how to recognize an object when you see it uh, is something that's going to help you if you ever get a job in, in software engineering of any sort or in a research lab. Um, you'll be much more advanced. Uh, so that said, the concepts in the first two weeks, um, you guys should be reviewing and reviewing and reviewing until you really get it. Functions, variables, um, plotting, modules, um, all that sort of stuff. Uh, the classes are something that um, once you understand that, that's the next thing that you should be working on. And what we're seeing this week is, again, going to be more tools um, that are a little more advanced. You can kind of get away with uh, doing parts of a project if you have someone else to work with without some of these tools. Um, but if you're doing a big project, you're going to need these tools. So I'm going to introduce all of you guys to it in lectures. Um, but in the labs, for those of you who are still working on concepts from week one, week two, week three, you don't have to do this lab. Um, until you master that stuff. That said, you really do need to master the concepts of week one and week two, definitely, um, and hopefully week three as well to move on to the projects. So for those of you who still feel kind of shaky on that, and we've seen that in some of the quizzes, et cetera, um, that's going to be your focus today. And just listen and hear some of these terms in the lecture, but you're not going to need to apply them. You'll get to see them again in your projects. And luckily, there's several advanced people in the class who are going to really apply this this week in their own code, and they'll be able to um, be the person on your project team who is able to kind of work with these concepts. So, as I said, chapter four is a mishmash of advanced concepts, and the good news is you've already learned all the basics of Python. Objects, types, classes, functions, and methods. Those are kind of the basic building blocks, the Legos we're going to be playing with. Um, we've looked a little bit object-oriented versus functional styles of programming. Um, we've looked at using external modules, including NumPy and Matplotlib, to work with real data. And that using external modules is key because that means that if someone else writes code that you're interested in working with, like to sequence DNA, to access law records on the internet, whatever, you don't have to write that code from scratch. You have all the tools to be able to work with that code and kind of read the description and maybe figure out one simple thing that you can do um, that will put you very far ahead from any of your colleagues. Um, so this is enough mastery to get you an internship or to make contributions to open source Python projects before we even start this chapter. And as well, if you're feeling a little overwhelmed, we're publishing all the curriculum online, all the lectures, all the videos, etc. So this could always be something that Say this week you really get the concepts of chapter one and two, but you don't get the concepts of three. But you know you maybe want a really high paying internship your freshman year of college. You could work on chapter three on your own uh, from the textbook and with the exercises um, over the next six months. Really get it going and then you'll be in a position where you're ready to go. Um, so focus on really mastering concepts. Um, if you don't get something, try it out in IPython, try it over and over and over again until you really get it, and um, know that this is a whole course that would be offered to, say, a college freshman. Um, so if it's been a little too fast for you, maybe you're a little bit younger in high school, et cetera, you can always independent study um, this material going forward because all of it's going to be available. Um, that said, to apply all this knowledge in a real-world environment, um, you'll certainly make use of a few more concepts. Uh, for example, setting up your own Python environment. That means installing it on a computer instead of using Python anywhere. 
uh, the Python standard library, so even more tools uh, that are distributed with Python, uh, more bash console usage, uh, whether you call that advanced or not, we've learned the basics to just install the software. Um, now we're going to learn some things about what happens when something goes wrong with installing the software, about how to do um, more advanced things with the Bash console, about testing your code, and probably most importantly, something called version control, which is how teams of software engineers, teams of people working on a project work together. Um, in a way that makes sure that individual people can all make changes to code and it's very well integrated together. Um, so that's what this chapter is about. Uh, but again, make sure you've mastered the concepts of the previous chapters before moving on to this chapter. And there's many people in the class who have, there's many people in the class who haven't. Um, so again, just kind of check in with yourself and focus on the material from chapters one and two and hopefully get to three as well. Um, so installing Python, now in the, uh, in the appendix of the textbook, there's a little note about how to install Python on your own machine. Um, and this could be your laptop or your computer at home, your computer at school. Um, most professionals install Python on their own machines. They don't work with Python anywhere or anything like that. Um, and you can do this from python.org and follow the instructions to install. Um, and that just installs Python. In this class, we've been working with a bunch of external modules related to scientific computing, um, like NumPy and Matplotlib. These don't come with the Python from python.org, and it's a little hard to install on yourself, uh, by yourself. So uh, there are various groups of Python packages that have them already installed for you, and one popular in installation is called Anaconda, uh, which I guess is a type of Python. Um, so it is an installation that already includes not only um, the standard library of Python, but also more than 100 of the most popular Python packages without you having to do anything, including NumPy, Matplotlib, and many others. And then uh, more packages can be installed with Anaconda's take on a package manager. It's very similar to pip, which we've already worked with, except it's called Conda. Um, and you can visit www.continuum.io to install for your platform. And there are more instructions in the textbook appendix. Um, I very much uh, suggest that you do this installation at home and not in lab. First of all, the internet access in lab is a little sketchy. Um, secondly, a lot of the exercises, including the Git exercises, are a lot easier to do on Python anywhere than on your own machines. Um, so I would, uh, for this week, do the exercises until you get to the problems um, on Python Anywhere and then install um, Python on your own machine uh, at home and then do the problems which we have um, on your own machine instead of on Python Anywhere. Okay, so we're going to learn more about the Bash console. and. Um, I know some people like Nico already know a lot of, a lot of this. Um, it'll be a couple minutes of review, but then we'll get to more advanced concepts that you might not already know. Um, so we're going to learn a few more important commands, ls, cd, pwd, mkdir, and man. I think we might have already met man. Uh, the names of the commands can be a bit like Harry Potter spells. Um, you'll learn them, but it might take some time, and the more advanced commands might take even a lifetime. We're not going to use some of the more advanced commands. Um, and in the following, in quotes, I'll uh, indicate a mnemonic to remember the name and the function together. Um, so that even though some of these names are kind of not pronounceable, you'll be able to remember them. So ls means list. It lists the contents of a directory. You can list our current directory by typing ls. Um, then PWD uh, stands for print working directory. So if you type PWD, it would print your current directory. Make dir is make directory. Um, a directory you might have also heard called a folder. They're the same thing. Um, so you can make a new directory, my stuff, for example, by typing make dir my stuff. Uh, CD means change directory. And again, in quotes is just how I remember it. Um, sometimes their official names are different, um, but it helps me, uh, at least did help me when I was first learning these commands when, when I was 
um, a little bit older than your age. So I'll actually pull up a terminal and um, we'll see some of these commands in action. Okay, so I am going to do ls, and that's all the, the stuff in my home directory. Um, I can go to my desktop, and that's all the stuff on my desktop. Um, this kind of just, so here we go. It's all the stuff on my desktop. So if I wanted to make a new folder, uh, now let's compare this to what we can see on the actual desktop. So here when I type ls, we can see there's a PDF there, there's a folder called clean, and there's a file called testcron.txt. So if I go ahead and look at my desktop, let's go ahead and look at my desktop, and it's right there, and we see that matches. Over there on the right, we have a folder called clean, uh, we have a PDF, uh, and we have a, a file, testcron.txt. So when I type ls, it's the same thing that you would see with your eyes if you're just clicking around. Um, and now if I go ahead and make a new folder, I can make a new folder called my stuff with the make dir, uh, make directory command. So my stuff. And now if I do ls, I'll see there's a new folder there. And if I go back, um, let's see. It's loading. Yeah. Huh. Uh, hopefully it'll figure out what's going on now. There we go. So now we see there's a new folder called my stuff there. What's up, Crystal? Is, is it like a, a table of contents? Yeah, you could think of it as a table of contents, like for what's at that place. Um, so now if I click on the folder, my stuff, we'll see there's nothing in it uh, right now. There's nothing in there. But I'm going to drag this file in there now. Uh, so let's drag this in there. I know, but I, the, what we're going to do is show, um, as we meet these commands, what they do. So now my stuff has a test cron dot text inside of it. Um, so let's go now back to the desktop and we see that 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 file is now gone. And then if I change di Nico, if you have a question, I will answer a question. If you don't have a question, I have decided to present the material in a certain order because people who have not seen the material before um, don't want to hear everything at once. Um, and one day you will be a teacher as well, and you can choose the material that will make it make sense to you. Um, but I'm sure you will get the chance in teams. When you work in teams, it's great to have someone on your team who understands this and is able to explain it really well. So it's great that you have your own ideas on explaining it really well, because I think you'll get the chance to do that quite a number of times. <laughs> um, so we won't do that on the recording today, but don't worry, you'll get the chance to show off your knowledge. Um, Great. Okay, so now we're going to change directory into my stuff. So now if I do an ls on my stuff, um, someone who hasn't seen this before, what do you think it's going to say? What, Crystal? Are we just in there? Yeah. File? Yeah, so what file did I just put in there? Do you remember? Come look. That? The test cron dot test. Yeah. Um, so, as well, um, as Nico was pointing out, um, this is a command. You can see the dot dot means go back to where I just was. One directory, not just was, but go one directory up. So here we're back on the desktop. Um, and instead of having to, when I go into my stuff, my stuff is on the desktop. Um, so when I go cd dot dot, that means go back uh, one directory. Um, so I can also, here's this PDF file, so I can move MV, um, this, this PDF, into my stuff. And now I don't have that much on my desktop, which is great. So if I go into my stuff, now it has two files in it. And then if I go over here, you can see my stuff now has exactly um, what we put in there. And this is a very useful thing if you're uh, working with files. Um, sometimes you'll want to put programs in different folders and then run those programs. Sometimes you'll want to download someone else's code and run it, fix it. And you'll need to know how to, from the Bash console, get there. Um, 
What's nice is that uh, on Mac, and there's a way to do this on Windows as well, you can kind of see where stuff is that, uh, do you have a question, Nico? There's a better way. You can actually just drag the folder. There's many different ways. So was that a question? We're only taking questions. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There are many, many different ways um, to do something. So, um, but on both Mac and Windows, you can see where you are if you want to see where a file is um, by clicking, and this tells you uh, the different um, directories that we're in. So if we're in my stuff and we cd dot dot, which means go one directory up, we'll get to desktop. If we're in desktop and we cd dot dot, go one directory up, we'll get Corbett. If we're in Corbett and we cd dot dot, go one directory up, we'll get users. If we're in users, cd dot dot, we'll go one directory up, we're in Macintosh HD, hard drive. And then if we are in Macintosh HD, we can cd dot dot and we're on uh, my computer, which is named Celsius. Uh, Do you have a question, Nico? I will only take a question. Yeah. Is it a question? Yeah. Okay, so yes. Um, so in this case, um, Macintosh HD would be the highest level of directory, and my computer would be Celsius. Uh, the distinction there is that if I'm, um, we're going to learn about SSH. When I uh, SSH, um, where I SSH into, where it drops me off, is uh, the name Celsius, and then you'll be under Macintosh HD. Uh, thank you for that correction, Nico. Um, and we'll also take corrections, I should say. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, great. Um, so let's actually see that um, on, and you can see as well, uh, this is the name of my, my computer, Celsius. So you'll always see kind of Celsius, and uh, in this case, I've set it up so that it shows my current directory there. Um, so you can also do this PWD, print working directory command. And here we'll see the whole chain. Um, so here we see we're in users, Corbett, desktop, my stuff. Um, so actually it was doubly incorrect in that there, there wasn't a Celsius and there wasn't even a Macintosh HD. That's the mounted hard drive. Um, so here I'm in my stuff. If I CD one directory up, I'm in desktop, one directory up, in Corbett, one directory up, in users. Um, then, as well, if you're a particular user, I'm logged in on my own machine under the username Corbett, but other people could be logged in on my own machine under different usernames. Um, you have what's called a home directory. And I've used that concept uh, with many of you on Python Anywhere as well. Um, so my home directory is users slash Corbett, but there could be other users of my machine. Um, so I will just see what other users might be. So here, I have a couple different users, guest, um, there's a shared folder that would be shared between the different users, and then there's Corbett. So if I was logged in as a guest, um, my home directory would be within the guest folder. Since I'm logged in as Corbett, my home directory is within the Corbett folder. And that's um, sort of important to remember in that there's a shortcut, uh, which is this tilde, which means my home directory. So if I cd tilde, that will go uh, right into my home directory, users slash Corbett. Um, so I know my desktop folder is within my home directory, so instead of having to type users desktop Corbett desktop, now I'm on the desktop, I can also type same thing, um, desktop. And those are the same thing. Um, so our most important commands are ls, uh, move, um, make directory, and cd, change directory is very important because that's how we're going to be moving around. Um, so now we'll get uh, to something uh, called SSH. Um, and uh, 
I guess one other thing I'll mention is that from the bash console on a Mac machine, um, we'll see a lot of flashes in one direction. On a Windows machine, uh, which has a slightly different console that's not exactly bash, you will have a different flash direction. Um, so that's another reason why it's easier to do all these exercises on Python Anywhere um, until uh, you're able to set up, because not only do you have to set up Python on your own machine, you also have to set up the bash console on your own machine. Um, so SSH is what's called the secure shell. Um, it allows a programmer to remotely and securely connect to another computer. Um, oftentimes a programmer will want to do work on a website, a program or system that is not their own, but that lives on or is hosted on a remote computer. Um, the easiest way to work on that computer is to use SSH if you want to work from the bash uh, console or from some sort of console or scripted access. And how that works is from a console you can type SSH, whatever your username is, at the at symbol, just like in an email, uh, the address of the computer. Um, so on Python Anywhere, um, the username would be your Python Anywhere username, and the computer address. Um, in this case, uh, Python Anywhere has set up the ability that you can access the Bash console from SSH. Um, so you can, if you set up SSH on your own computer, the computer address is ssh.pythonanywhere.com. Um, and from Windows, you use uh, there's a application called Putty that you can use um, that will allow you to SSH, uh, not from the Bash shell, but from actually uh, filling out this information um, in a graphical user interface. Um, and again, all that information is in the textbook. Um, so this is more how you will um, later, if you set things up on your machine and you want to do something on Python Anywhere, you'll be able to very easily access Python Anywhere without using a web page um, and do that. Um, so I, I read it out loud, but it's in the text uh, book as well, but it's ssh.pythonanywhere.com. And then it'll... Pardon? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so they don't enable it by default, but because they're sponsoring us as a class, they've set up that we can SSH in there as well. Um, so if you've had... Uh, Nico, you have your computer set up so that you can SSH. If you want to do some of the exercises on Python Anywhere, you don't have to use the website. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about these things called environment variables. Um, so your computer's path or Python path are environment variables uh, that tell the computer where to find programs and what those programs depend upon that you might want to run. Uh, it tells the computer where to search for programs, for modules, and packages. Uh, path is for programs called from the Bash console or uh, Python interpreter. Um, or, like, for the Python interpreter. Uh, Python path is for items needed within Python. Uh, so, you'll need a dollar sign, um, and this is Bash's way of indicating that you want to access the value of the environment variable. Um, and here I'm using another command called echo, um, and that is a command to repeat what follows it. So here I'm asking Bash to uh, repeat or print um, whatever the value of the path variable is. Here I'm asking Bash to repeat or print whatever the, vari oh, the value of the Python path is. Now you're not going to have to deal with this all the time, but if you're installing your own Python software or creating your own Python modules and something doesn't work, these might be places to, to look. If it's like, I can't find that module, and you're like, I installed that module, um, this is where you might want to go to debug. Um, because if you have bash print these variables and whatever directory um, you've installed your software in, it's not in here. That's the reason why, um, why it can't be found. So I think I have my path um, variables set. So let's see what it says there. So clear. Um, so here I have a bunch of stuff on my path variable, and uh, some of that, um, for example, I have some custom software in pro local programs Julia. Um, I have some more Python software uh, in uh, library and thought Canopy, et cetera. Um, and so I've added all these to my path so that Python um, 
uh, so that I can find them. Um, so one thing that you can test is I can type which Python, and that will tell me where the Python command is living. So basically, when you call a command from the bash console, uh, it goes to your path, and in order, it looks in that directory and asks, it asks is there Python in there? And then uh, the colons separate the different directory. So then it goes to the next one, and it asks, is there Python in there? It goes to the next one, et cetera, et cetera. And the first place it, it reaches, which has a command called um, Python, then that's the Python that it uses. So order is also important here. So I can even type which um, ls. So we can find where the ls command is located. So here it's in slash bin ls. Um, I can type which which. Uh, so the which command is in user slash bin slash which. Um, and I can um, edit. Let's see. Um, I can edit my Python, uh, or not my Python path, um, I can edit my bash path, um, but there's a file that's run every time the bash console is opened, and you can change the path variables there. So I can also t change them from the uh, terminal itself, but those changes won't be, sh won't be saved. Um, so if you want it to do something to change your path every single time, you need to um, actually change your bash rc file, there's another file called bash underscore profile, and it depends on which console you use, uh, where exactly you change that, so that it's um, changed every time you open a new bash console. Um, so we already learned this. Uh, to see where the programs Python, IPython, LS, and CD are located on the computer, from the bash console you can run which, the command which. Um, so we did a couple of these examples. So if, if you're trying to type a command and it's like I can't find that, you might want to type which, and you can see either where it is or um, that it's not coming up. Um, and it's the same with Python path, which is um, Python path is used for all Python modules. When you go import SunPy, SunPy has to be on your Python path. And so far, this pip, the uh, Python package manager has handled when you install a module from pip, it automatically adds everything to your Python path. Um, but this chapter, we're going to install software on our own and fix bugs in that software. Um, and we'll have to make sure that that software, since we're installing it on our own, um, is on the Python path. Um, so we can edit the path variables. Um, you can edit these environment variables easily from the bash console on Python anywhere, on a Linux and OS X bash console on any of these bash consoles by setting the variable. Um, export, the variable name without the dollar sign equals um, the dollar sign, the variable name, a colon, and then the new directory you want to search. Um, this colon is how you separate individual directories to search for programs in, because you might want to search many program directories in. Um, the reason why I didn't just set path equals the new directory to search is I want to keep the old path. I don't want to have it not search any of those variables. I just want to add directly to what follows it. If we wanted to completely overwrite the old path, you can do that by leaving that section out. That's not recommended unless you're debugging, as it make, may make tools which you rely on um, from the bash console inaccessible. So if you edit your path in a certain way, it might not even be able to find CD or LS anymore. Um, and then that gets even harder to debug because all of a sudden all the tools that you need to debug are not in the path anymore. Um, so again, it's the same thing with Python path. Um, if you're having trouble with being unable to import a Python module, check the Python path. Uh, when you use a package manager like pip or conda, uh, newly installed modules are placed in some place accessible by the Python path automatically. And on Windows, editing these variables um, is a little different. That's indicated a little on um, the appendix of the textbook. I'm not an active Windows user. Um, I have used Windows like, twice in my life for a couple months. Um, so it is the case that I might have gotten some things wrong there. We'll work on doing it together if I did. Um, but uh, myself and another TA 
um, Sebastian kind of went over trying to make sure that we could get all this working on Windows as well. Um, so I mentioned this already, if you want to save your changes, um, it might help to do it in the Bash console just to make sure it works before you save it permanently. But once you find something that works, to make the variable change each time you launch a terminal, you need to edit um, some sort of file that's executed whenever uh, the Bash console loads. Uh, one such file is this .bashrc in your home directory. Um, and that's run every time the Bash console starts up. So if you put anything in there, um, it will modify the default settings by executing each line in the program in the Bash shell. Um, you can edit the file with nano, emacs, or vim. Um, we learned nano in the, in the last chapter, but you're welcome to edit it however you like. Okay. Um, so that's a bit on um, slightly more elaborate uses of Bash. Um, and now we're going to talk about software distribution. Um, so have any of you guys used Git before? Have you used Git? Have you used Git? Um, there are a variety of different ways of distributing software. Um, can be done by package managers like PIP or Condom. You can have binary installations where you just go to the website, you double click, it installs, that's it. That's what we all did before this class probably, many of us did. Um, or you can download the source code, um, if it's Python, the actual Python files, um, for installing the software manually. The final option is very convenient for software engineers, like you guys all now are, who want to see how a software pro program functions by looking at its source code, or even by modifying it prior to installation. Um, and eventually, when you're making your own um, uh, software for distributing it, it to others. Um, so, uh, once you, let's say, we're going to learn more about Git. Um, let's say we download uh, using Git um, some software um, from a web page or by using Git. Um, when we go ahead and install the Python software, um, we run the following command, python setup.py install, and I've added this dash dash user because on many machines, including on Python Anywhere, you can't install for any users um, on the machine. You can only install for you yourself. Um, so, and on Python Anywhere, we also, since there are many Python versions, we put a 3.5 here to indicate to install it for 3.5. Um, you may also need to build software that is C or C++ code. Um, in fact, uh, one of the assignments involves potentially doing that as you're debugging um, why something isn't working. Um, so here's a simple way of doing it. Sometimes you have to do much more advanced things to get things to work, um, to install on your, uh, in your own directory, um, not on the entire system. So you do something called configure, um, and then here I've said to install it exactly in the same directory I'm running the configure script from, because pwd is print working directory, which would be where I'm um, running this configure script from. So I'm saying configure the software, and I'm going to install it exactly where I'm running this configure script from, and then run make install. Um, then, uh, because this is uh, software using a different programming language, uh, the paths aren't Python paths, they're different paths. Um, you may need to, depending on the software, edit C include path, but C++ CPP include path, and load library path to point to the install directory, um, exactly where we installed it. Um, if you have access on your own machine, um, to all uh, kind of levels of the system, you can leave out the prefix portion and there's no need to change the paths. Um, so it does get a little complicated if you don't have um, access to everywhere on the machine, um, like most of us do in this class. Um, but this is also a good exercise. What's up? I just wanted to say some compilers uh, and source code is a little bit different. Um, the way I usually hear about it is that plus configure makes them to see stuff. So I think they can install by itself without running make search. It also works. Also. It does work, yeah. But yes. Well, that's right. Exactly. So, maybe that's um, right. Absolutely. So there are many more um, complications that your software may not work automatically by doing this. This is the shortest way of doing it um, that 
has a chance of working. Um, so this will work um, for the uh, exercises that we're doing this week. Um, so there is one um, C code that we'll go ahead and install. Um, the reason why it's sometimes good to separate out the make and make install is that uh, what make install does is it first makes and then it make installs and they can each have separate errors. So by separating them out, it's easier to debug the errors, whether it's coming from make or make install. There's also other different options. How a software developer does this, if you're a C developer or C++ developer, um, it's set up by the developer themselves, what does work. Um, basically, they edit um, what's called a make file that specifies which commands um, that might use, uh, be useful in uh, a system, a build system, in this case, new make, that helps us build the software. Um, you can also build C or C++ code without um, using these installations, um, which is easy if you have just one file. If you have many files, it ends up being typing so much um, that uh, developers have made uh, files that kind of automate some of that procedure. But because this isn't necessarily standard, um, Depending on the C or C++ code, your build system could be completely different. So there's also something called CMake. Um, sometimes people's make installs actually are going to scripts and not using GNU make. Um, but this is sort of the most common and simplest uh, way to install C and C++ code. Um, okay. So, um, so far in this course, uh, You've mostly been working alone, a little bit asking questions to friends and, and the TAs, the teaching assistants. Um, but software programs, whether they're being made by scientists or in the corporate community, Google, Microsoft, etc., often take tens to hundreds to thousands of programmers uh, working on the same software to produce. And sometimes it can be hundreds of thousands to millions um, to tens of millions of lines of code. So that's more than one person could ever read in their lifetime. Um, they sat there reading it. So it really requires teams of people working together and people at different levels. Um, so one job that you can get with some of this training is not as a software developer, but what is called a project manager, where your job is to know all the different pieces of software, what they do, know a little bit about computer programming as much as you can, and help people work in teams um, to deal with these big changes. So if someone says, we'd love to add this new feature on Google, your job as a project manager could be, okay, I know um, we need to have Sterling, we need to have Crystal, we need to have Momo. Um, they're working on these different teams, and then I would go to each of you and say, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. And each of you would work on your individual part, and the project manager's job is to make sure that all the parts work together and that all the people are working on time. Um, there are also programs which are worked on by volunteer coders who collaborate together or even raise funds to pay certain contributors. Some of these projects are he headed by foundations who organize their development. Others are independently or collectively organized. Um, and those programs, uh, because they have kind of often distributed leadership, there isn't necessarily one person who tells you what to do because it's all volunteers. Um, it requires a very um, easy way of integrating different contributions by different people. Um, there's this concept of closed versus open source software. So an organization, your company, say you have a startup company, say you're Google, you can choose to have what's called a closed source program where a hobbyist or another company can't see the source code of how the program is made. You might release the program, but they can only click a button and install it. They can't see the actual code behind it. Um, other organizations choose to have what's called an open source code, which is where anyone in the world can see the code. Um, an organization might choose to have this, um, to have more help or interest from the community or volunteers, or if the code is especially critical, um, to have more software engineers check and verify the code. Um, each organization can choose the way, if any, in which other companies or individuals are allowed to change the code that they share by picking a software license, which is a legal document that defines the choice. So if you're lawyers, uh, if you want to be a lawyer one day, this can also be a, a portion of law that you go into in terms of um, software licensing and patent um, law. Uh, and this is all very good um, knowledge to set you up for a career doing that. Um, so this means that there's a variety of different ways of interacting with, with code. Um, so how many of you guys have used Google Docs 
at all ever? Yeah, let's see. You've seen um, in Dropbox papers the same way. It can be edited by many people. It's a great way to collaboratively edit a document. Um, and unlike using an editor like Word, TextEdit, Sublime, Nano, Enumix, Vim, etc., many people can make changes all at once. Um, it does require internet access to immediately see other people's changes. Um, some of these programs give you some offline access as well. Um, if we're going to do this with software, it might be hard to manage and track down bugs. If everyone can make changes all at once, um, who is changing what, and if there's a problem, which piece of code caused the problem. Um, what's also nice is with many of these tools, you can go back and say you make a mistake, you can go back to a previous version. So you can say, oh, you know, I really want to go back to what I wrote yesterday. Um, many of these tools allow you to do that. And it's the same with software, except for they do it in a little bit more of a controlled way so that it's not a nightmare um, to change or track down um, a bug. Because if you have hundreds of thousands of people working on the same file, if someone makes a typo in there um, and many other people are editing at once, it's hard to figure out uh, where the problem is. Um, so if we want to work together on a software tool, we want regular files, just plain text files that don't require any internet access to change and which clearly track the changes so that we can revert or go back to earlier working versions or versions with different features um, with ease. Uh, companies might want to keep all their code changes within the company or limit changes to just a group of people or have groups of people work and synchronize separately um, on different features before integrating those new software functionalities into the main program. So I might want to say, okay, we have Google Docs as is. Momo is going to work on a new feature that lets us make it black and orange for Halloween. And Crystal is going to work on a new feature that makes it blue and white for, I don't know, some sort of reason. And if you guys were both doing that at once, uh, you might, uh, as you're working in progress, make changes in the code that break things. Um, but if we have a way that you're able to each separately work on things, and then only when your work is perfect, put it back in the main, um, in the main code, uh, that would be quite nice. And that's called branching. Um, and we'll learn about that, but we won't do that in class. Um, so software engineers enjoy collaborating with each other. It's absolutely required to get big projects done. Uh, many software engineers spend um, just a few days, uh, hours a day actually coding. Um, so the average software engineer writes just 10 lines of code per day, which is kind of crazy. You guys are writing a lot more than 10 per day, I feel like, right? Um, so when you're learning, you're definitely doing a lot. And that's on average, right? So some days you might write 1,000 lines of code in a day. Uh, sometimes you might write zero. And that's because you're going to meetings, you're working in teams, you're working with project managers, you're discussing features. You're maybe trying things out, but then those lines of code don't even make it into the final version of the, the software. Um, so collaboration is a huge part of the job. Um, and that's why uh, a full third of the course, we're going to be working in teams um, to learn that part of, of the fun of um, software engineering and being able to work on uh, projects that are bigger than any one developer. Um, so you can, of course, want to work on a project that's smaller, um, that one developer, one software engineer, you yourself can do. But to really do something important, you're going to have to do something that no matter what, if you were coding 24 hours straight per day with your maximum brain power, you wouldn't be able to do. You just have to work with others. And that's why um, we heard from Andrew Pryor Miller from Snapchat. He took a couple years off um, from software engineering to work on what he called his soft skills. Now, soft skills are skills like presenting, interacting with people, collaborating, um, selling uh, your product, selling your vision. So if you have a feature in the software convincing your teammates, convincing your boss, um, what to do that. If you're the CEO of a company, uh, raising venture capital, raising money, um, getting customers. So all of those, those skills are um, important. And the most successful software engineers are not only great software engineers, but they're also really, really great at that. Um, and um, people like Bill Gates runs foundations, does public speaking. Um, nowadays, Bill Gates probably hasn't written a line of code in many years, um, even though he's at Microsoft. Um, because the majority of what he's doing is interacting with other people, like you guys are going to be writing code for him. And he needs to understand the big picture of the code, but he doesn't necessarily need to understand every, every single 
Um, and in fact, that's, most software engineers uh, work doing the first stage of their career, majority coding, the second stage of their career, majority working with a team of people, helping them code. Um, um, okay, so version control. Uh, Google Drops and Dropbox Paper allow you to select and see past versions of the same document. Keeping track of versions of the document is called version control and can help us have a backup of our work as well as being able to undo or revert. And this is especially important with software. If one of you guys makes a feature for Google and then we integrate that feature and then all of a sudden it breaks everything, we want to be able to very easily say, hold on a sec, let's just undo and go back to the previous version, go back and make sure that that, that works. Um, so Git is one program for version control, software collaboration and software distribution. And this has been the most popular system for this in recent years among software engineers. Other programs include Subversion, also known as SCN, Mercurial, also known as HG. Um, in this course, we will learn to work with Git. Um, there's a website called github.com. Um, this week, instead of using a package manager like PIP or Conda to install the software, we need to do the exercises. We're going to download and work with the original source code from github.com using Git. Uh, this will help us practice the tools we need to collaborate in teams as software engineers, and we're going to use this in the final projects. Uh, GitHub.com is one website for hosting uh, what are called Git repositories. Uh, there are many others. Bitbucket.com is another example. You can even make your own. Um, so, um, again, this week there's not going to be a Python notebook. Um, instead, what you're going to do is download the exercises using Git. Um, from github.com and the first thing you're going to do is set up a username and this is also really good um, even if you're just doing uh, minor things with Python you put your code on github.com and you go ahead and interview for a job uh, they often ask for your github they want to see some of your code um, it's like a social network for coders as well um, and this is how a lot of programmers share their work um, so I recommend that as you're even as you're learning, um, if you put your software on GitHub, um, if you go ahead and interview for an internship or anything like that, um, you can just show them that software, and that will be one part of even having a GitHub.com. It's already an indication that um, you're not just a hobbyist, but that you are really working hard on becoming a better software engineer. Um, so this week, we're going to use the repository for the Python package AstroML which will help us do machine learning, artificial intelligence, analysis on a variety of astrophysics data sets. Um, so how you download that software is with this git clone command, and then you enter um, the address of the git repository. All operations with git will start with git. Uh, the clone command takes the software from the remote repository and places it on your computer. Um, and then as we went over before, uh, once you download it, it will create an Astro ML directory, which is the um, Git repository. Then you can change directories in there, and then you can install the software. And in the exercise this week, it's going to fail um, because uh, there's a problem with the software. Um, we're going to fix that problem in the exercise. Um, so, and this is something that often happens, and this is one of the reasons why it's good to um, learn how to install on your own from a Git repository, is sometimes, because there are so many different pieces of software out there, um, something's out of date. Maybe a web link that the software's relying on doesn't work. Um, maybe the software works with Python 3.2, but it doesn't work with 3.5, so you might have to make a little small change. Hopefully it's little and small, often it is, um, when software doesn't work. It's one line that you have to find to fix. Um, and tracking down that line is a little bit of detective work. Um, but when you're working with a new project, say you guys decide for your group project, we want to do something with asteroids. Then you see, oh, there's a Python module that does a lot with asteroids. I want to download that. You try to install it with pip, and it says, ah, something went wrong. What do you do next? Do you just give up? Um, if you really have to do this project for work or, you know, for school, you can't just give up. So one thing you could do is write the original developers. Hey, what's the problem here? He's in Google. You can see. Sometimes the original developers, they're like, I've moved on. I'm not working on that software anymore. I did that just as a fun project. I've moved on. I can't help you. Other times they don't answer. 
Um, so who has to fix it? That's you. Um, and oftentimes it's a little, little, little fix because the software used to work. It's on a website, so it used to work. Um, so the reason why it doesn't work anymore is often something really small. And um, so here, uh, something doesn't work with AstroML, so we download it from the source, we try to install it, and we can see exactly um, what isn't working and why. Um, git add is the command that lets git know uh, to track a file. Um, anything that isn't added isn't tracked. You know, only need to add a file once. Occasionally, git cannot automatically merge changes made by yourself or by another colleague. Then you'll have to look at the two changes side by side and pick which to go with. To do that, you'll need to add the file you've just merged again. Um, basically, a git repository is just like a typical folder. It has a bunch of things in it, except for because it's a git repository, it understands git commands. Um, and it, we've downloaded it, say, if we download it from github.com. Um, I could say, I want to add a new file to be on github.com. And here's how you do it. You make a new file, myfile.py. You would type git add myfile.py. And then that tells from now on git track this. You could make another file called mysecretfile.py. And if you don't add it, git won't track it. It's just on your computer and it's not going to go up to the other computer. And that's useful because sometimes you want to have files that are just for you, like passwords or, or something like that, hopefully encrypted on a database. Um, but sometimes it'll be maybe something silly that you're just prototyping and you don't necessarily want to be on the, the remote machine. Um, git commit is the command which says, uh, now actually uh, track my work. Uh, you don't need an internet connection for this or even access to the remote repository to access the powerful features of git um, in that every time you commit, that's a version that you can go back to, kind of like saving your work. So once I commit, I, I say, okay, I can make a little note with it, first commit, and say I make a bunch of different changes, I've done hundreds of different things, and I want to go back to my first commit. I can look at, um, at the notes and see what the first commit was and go back to that. Um, so it's a good idea to have a message afterwards. Um, whatever comes after the dash M is the message associated with the commit. And the more descriptive you are in that, um, the better it is to be able to go back to previous versions. So softwares, you might have seen version 3.1, version 3.2, 3.4, 3.5. Um, oftentimes, that corresponds to a particular git commit. This is version 3.1. So if you want to go back to version 3.1, um, you know how to do that from, from git. Um, and if you have that message and it's very descriptive, it's very easy to track what you did in the commit. Um, so finally, git push is the command that shares your changes with some remote repository on another machine. So uh, Crystal might not be able to access Sierra's machine, but Crystal could say, I'm going to push my, my changes to github.com, and Sierra will be able to get changes from github.com. So you won't need to have passwords on each other's machines to share your work. Um, so in this class, we're going to only work with one remote repository at the, a time, but there are also options to have multiple remote repositories. Um, so the last command that we'll need um, is git pull. Um, that's one way to retrieve changes made to the remote git repository. If your teacher, a collaborator, or a classmate makes changes by pushing those changes, uh, you can retrieve the changes, the updates, with git pull. Um, so we have git add, which says I made something new, git, track it. We have git commit, which says, okay, this is a good place, maybe I want to come back to this in the future, um, track my work. We have git push, which is um, share my changes with the remote repository, and git pull, which is get new changes for the remote repository. So when a bunch of people are working, say, on your project, you'll all have different uh, clones of the repository, you'll all be making different changes. When you're ready to share those changes, you commit and then push. When you're ready to get changes from a friend or from many different friends, you get pull and that'll download those changes. And that way, everyone's able to work on software. And if you have a bug, uh, if you haven't pushed the bug, it doesn't make it hard for everyone else to work. So you can fix your bug before pushing it. Um, so you're able to do whatever you want locally, and only when you push your changes does that share with your teammates. So that's another very important thing that you want to check that uh, whatever changes you make um, don't affect other people negatively. 
Um, so if you're working in a really big team and you make a change that breaks everything, um, that's, your teammates aren't going to be super happy. So there's a bunch more that you can do with Git. Um, that's beyond the scope of just this course. There are a variety of tutorials online. Particularly, you're going to want to know how branches work. Branches are different sets of code changes stemming from the same original. Branches are very useful to be able to work on many different sets of code changes at once, switch between them, um, and uh, to also um, share your work with others. Um, okay. Um, so uh, what we will do in lecture two um, is we're going to learn more about Python testing, testing Python code, and we're going to also learn about some more Python advanced usage in terms of functions. Um, again, what we're going to do in the lab today, um, there's a bunch of exercises in the textbook, and the exercises are actually even required to get the problems. Um, and so other, other weeks you were able to kind of jump to the problems right away. Here you really have to do the exercises to even get access to the problems, because it's going to involve using Git. Um, to get access to those problems. Uh, so for those of you who um, made, finished Notebook 3 and did, did a good job on Notebook 3, whether or not you did the capstone of Notebook 3, well, um, move on to this chapter. If you didn't finish Notebook 3, if you're still struggling with concepts from Notebooks 1 and 2, work on that today and um, just keep some of this in your head because you will, uh, in your projects, be using Git. Um, so will be a bit of a, a learning curve um, later, um, but you can always go back to this chapter to try to reference what's going on. Um, okay, so we'll take a five-minute break and then go over to Eastbridge um, for lab.